Good evening. Um, welcome to the new school. My name is Karen Cooney. I'm the director of the Vera Lee Center for Art and Politics here at the new school. And truly delighted to see you here in such uh, incredible and vast numbers, despite the inclement weather, to hear Paul Stamets in the lecture Mushroom for People and Planet, Ancient Alleys for Modern Maladies. As um, director of the Verlist Center, I'm just going to give you um, a, a bit of context um, in order to set the stage for the lecture, and then um, it won't take long, and then we will hear um, first Gary Linkoff and then Paul Stamets. Um, when we come together in spaces such as this one, there is, of course, the architecture that shapes um, how, what unfolds in these spaces and how we feel. In our case tonight, it's the new school's brand new Tishman Auditorium that was constructed to provide a hub for the university and the public here in the center of New York City. But we also come together and bring with us the knowledge and I dare say in this case, wisdom of people who came before us. Uh, tonight, there are two I would like to evoke. John McDonald Moore, whose friends and family members supported this lecture series is one of them. He was one of the New School's most beloved teachers, an art historian who was as much an artist as the people he spoke and lectured about. And I think Professor Moore would be pleased by the sheer number and diversity of people assembled for the lecture named in his honor. I also would like to mention another pillar of self-understanding of this institution, and that is John Cage and his association with the university. It began with a friendship between fellow composer, critic, and faculty member Henry Cowell, who invited John Cage in 1950 to take part in some, quote, academic discussions and do some performances. A few, a few years later, J. Cage became a faculty member himself, but only under one condition. If he were to teach a music class at the new school, he would only do so if he could also teach a mushroom identification class. The new school agreed, and so he did, together with Guy Neering, a class that resulted in the revival of the New York Mycological Society in 1962, of which I believe many members are here tonight. John, yes. <laughs> John Cage, in his um, text for the birds, famously proclaimed, and I'm quoting he, him, it is useless to pretend to know mushrooms, they escape your erudition. The more you know them, the less sure you feel about identifying them. I believe our two speakers tonight, to whom I'll seize the podium momentarily, will prove Cage wrong, or at least not right, and uh, we'll point to a myriad of other benefits beyond identification that mushrooms hold for us. And so it gives me great pleasure to now introduce Gary Linkoff, who in turn will welcome uh, Paul Stamets in just a few moments to the stage. Gary is, as many of you know, the education chair of the New York Mycological Society. He is the author of the Audubon Society's Field Guide to North American Mushrooms and many, many other books. He is the eminence grise of mushrooms who has inspired, I think it's fair to say, generations of scientists, but also artists and curators such as myself, and assembles, together with the society, an extraordinarily lively group of mushroom lovers every single weekend when we for, um, have our forays and outings to Staten Island, the Bronx, or Central Park. Gary is also a contributor of a book that the Verilis Center recently published. It is called Speculation Now, and is an investigation on the political, artistic, and scientific potential of speculation. Let me close with a few brief lines from the Hymn to Mycology with lyrics by W. Malter, and I'm just reading the words. I won't um, sing it. Here we go. Um, many of you could, though. Deep, deep in the murky shadow, there where the slime mold creeps, with joy the stout mycologist, his palate harvest reaps. No cloud of noxious insects, no landlord squamous heart can stay our dedication to the mycologic art. And with that, um, 
please, Gary, come to the stage and um, introduce Paul. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Karen, and thank you for making this possible. Um, I thought I would be coming as an opening act, but I hear it's just an introduction and I'm not supposed to be here the whole evening. Um, but I've come with many hats, and this is one of them, um, because this is co-sponsored by two groups. One is the New York Mycological Society, um, if you are a member of the New York Mycological Society, would you just raise your hand? Right. So, um, and thank you. And if I would like, um, after the program is over, for the New York Mycological Society to meet together outside um, by that table, but in a way that doesn't prevent other people from leaving. So, Erin. Uh, for just a few moments. Um, and just as a plug for the society, we have been engaged in a six or seven or eight year survey going out every single weekend of the year. There is no off season to find all the different kinds of mushrooms that occur in New York City, especially in New York City parks. And so we go to a different park every weekend um, over and over, we hit every borough. We even go to a place called Staten Island. You can find it on a map. Um, we hit places that other people say, oh, I didn't know that was there. The point is, we are going into these different woods and wooded areas, and we are coming out with things that no one knew existed. We have found many of the people in this society have found mushrooms that it may be the first record for um, the city for sure, maybe even for the whole region. Um, and it just takes 20 people, actually a dozen or so, going out every week and really probing the woods. And sometimes we get 20 or 30 or 40, and now this is the, the rainy season, so we've been getting really good mushrooms. So if you are interested in edibles and you would perhaps not like to be poisoned by mushrooms, that would be a good in indicator that maybe you should attend some of our walks. Those walks are posted on the New York Mycological Society Facebook page, and there is a website for the New York Mycological Society. So I hope you will avail yourself of that possibility to come out with us. Um, we have people of all ages, and we rely on actually, we we actually do rely on a wide range of different um, groups, people, ages, um, to find the mushrooms that we need to see. There are people who can't see anything that's smaller than a millimeter, and there are others who can see things that are a speck. So, and I know some of you just want to find chanterelles. Those are here too. All right, so with my other hat, say that the new school has, is celebrating the publication of a book called Speculation Now. And it is the kind of book that if Marshall McLuhan were here, I think he would enjoy. Uh, because it, it's infused in a way with, with a lot of the things that interested him um, when he was writing. And one of the ways I would like to introduce our speaker tonight, Paul, is through the very concept of speculation. And to do that, rather than quoting from the book itself, I would like to just um, mention something from one of my favorite authors, Lewis Carroll. Um, many of you have read those Alice books forever, and I know you've memorized whole passages from them. But one of my favorites is when Alice is um, uh, engaged in conversation with the queen, and the queen asks her something that um, Alice says, well, that's impossible. And the queen says, what's the problem with that? And she said, being a most sensible girl, she says, one can't believe in impossible things. The queen then responded, well, that just shows a lack of practice. Sometimes, 
I believed in six impossible things before breakfast. The point of that is that what was in many cases thought to be impossible back when Lewis Carroll was writing are now part of our lives, our culture. Um, they had no rocket ships. They had no um, iPhones. They couldn't even imagine these things, and they were quite impossible, and we have them now. And if we go back to the time when Lewis Carroll was writing, which was in the 1850s, there were two kingdoms of life on the planet as recognized in science. One was the kingdom of the animals, and one was the kingdom of the plants. And mushrooms? They weren't even an afterthought. Mushrooms were the sorts of things that were studied by people that even botanists didn't talk to. They were so far removed in the, in the field of biology that they were in an antechamber of an antechamber. Possibly the only people more distant would have been people studying slime molds. Well, we have come a huge way since then. And what we have tonight, I think, is a way of showing, I wish, I, I only wish we had that 19th century audience here, because what had been a marginal organism, group of organisms, even when I was growing up, even more recently than that, um, even today in many places, marginal and of no relevance, that is useful as a condiment, possibly something that, oh my God, people know not to pick mushrooms. There are poisonous things in the woods. Um, you keep hearing this. Still, what we've now moved into is looking at mushrooms, and this is where Paul comes in, looking at mushrooms as not marginal, but central to understanding the whole ecology of life on planet Earth, not just the ecology um, of organisms in a forest ecosystem, but ecology here in our urban ecosystem, and our own personal ecology, because you could not survive without the fungi that are on you and in you. Um, we make a kind of a connection um, and a, a, a central way of, of living is Im embedded in what Paul, I think, came up with the worldwide, the, the wood wide web. And it's essentially fungi. Paul Stamets, um, when we started back in the 70s, we were all sort of feeling our way, looking at different things. The difference between most of us and Paul is that he would have an idea. It would be a thought. We would be talking about it. And he would say, carpenter ants. Well, I bet we could do something because if everyone is complaining about carpenter ants, there must be a non-toxic way to get them out of your house. And he found the way with fungi. One of the things you're going to hear tonight is his solution for bees, which is, it is a headline in almost all our papers, and we would be without the honeybees look at the grocery shelves and ask what would be there if we didn't have those bees. And Paul has, as he'll tell you, come up with a solution. Paul is a solver of problems. He has won just about every award that can be given to him, and he has managed to reach different populations of people. Uh, most of us in the world of mushrooms, don't go beyond the world of mushrooms. And we know 20 people, 50 people, 100 people. Paul has learned to work in other venues. And so he is reaching out to physicians. He's reaching out, God forbid, to the government and finding out that there are some people listening. And this is a remarkable accomplishment in addition to everything else he's done he has 
manage to communicate our realities, has, how we see things, to people who haven't got a clue. And I, um, I think with that, that's probably more than enough, because Paul will kill me if I say any more. I would like now to introduce my friend, longtime friend, Paul Stamets. Thank you. Well, I'm greatly honored to be here, and thank you, Gary, uh, for that great introduction. Uh, Gary and I first met in uh, like 1975, 1976. Um, so this is going to be an immersion talk. It's going to take some surprising turns. Uh, I'm probably more surprised than anyone has, uh, will be. Um, there's a series of events that have occurred over the, the past 30, 35 years that have, um, I don't know how to describe it, really. I think. Uh, showing you the presentation, maybe you can describe to me how this came about, because I'm still very mystified by it. But anyhow, we're gonna, I speak relatively quickly, um, and at the end I have a big surprise. It's, it's about the bees, and uh, something that's counterintuitive, but it's something I think is an interesting insight. I'm hoping that your lives will forever be changed for the better. I hope from this day forward you will look at mycelium and mushrooms in a whole different light. Now, um, before I jump into my slides, a lot of you are probably wondering about this very cool hat. I like this hat. It makes me look very handsome, I think. And this hat is made from a mushroom called amadou. Amadou is a, a birch polypore, a hard wood conch. And amadou is a mushroom that um, is a reason why uh, humans were able to survive um, during winter. There's no doubt that we all came from Africa. 43,000 years ago. We are all Africans, genetically. And we moved into the north, into Europe, and we discovered something new called winter. Oops. <laughs> and this mushroom allowed for the portability of fire. You can haul this mushroom out, put embers of fire inside, and carry fire for days. Now, when you, uh, and the, keep, the fire keeper of the clan was absolutely critical for the clan's survival. Without the fire being kept alive during the wintertime, you would perish. And this mushroom, moreover, when you put it in water and you boil it, it delaminates into mycelium. You'll see lots of mycelium during the course of this talk. And this hat was made by some ladies in Transylvania. Um, this mushroom was first described by Hippocrates in around 450 BCE as an anti-inflammatory and for cauterizing wounds. Now, this mushroom also um, had other utilitarian purposes. Um, as I described, it delaminates into a fabric, and here's some of this fabric. It's highly flammable. It revolutionized warfare because in Napoleonic times, it allowed flint spark rifles to ignite the gunpowder. It also was used by fly fishermen who could dry their flies. It was also used by beekeepers throughout Europe to smoke the hives. So this is what I think it speaks to where mushrooms fit so uniquely and many other plants and animals that are shamanistically important is they have a multiplicity of benefits and so, from a utilitarian point of view, the great the Iceman had this as well in order to, 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 to a tinder fire. And the idea that you could be able to have one substance that had many different uses made it a really important thing for you to carry with you through life. So, we'll be talking about Amadou, and we'll be talking about some other polypore mushrooms in particular. Um, and there is another mushroom that is very, very common. You've all seen it. It's called the red belted polypore, Fomitopsis panicula. Um, and the red-belted polypore is very common on conifer and hard, uh, hardwood trees. It's really common. Most all of you have seen it, I'm sure, whether you knew it or not. But there's another mushroom friend that I brought, which I think is really interesting. And this mushroom is called agaricon. Agaricon is one of the rarest mushrooms in the world. It was first described by Dioscorides as, uh, in 65 AD in the very first Materia Medica as Elixirium ad longum vitum, the elixir of long life. Now, agaricon grows only in the old growth forests uh, of the world, now restricted to Northern California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, a few sky islands in Europe, but largely extinct in Europe because of the cutting down the old growth forests. Without the old, without the old growth forests, this mushroom basically does not grow. I think that agaricon will be as important, or if not more important, in modern times 
as Amadou was the fire starter mushroom and allowing for the portability of fire as we migrated into Europe. And so I suggest to you that if we follow the path of mycelium and we look at these mushrooms that grow in these environments, I think they'll lead to a lot of the solutions that we face today. So here we go. So I'd like to open my talks with this. This is what I call mycelial earth. But the title of my talk is biodiversity is biosecurity. And that is so important today. We have about 8.3 million species on this planet, uh, currently estimated. We're losing around 30,000 species per year. That means in 100 years, we'll lose more than 30% of the species on this planet that helped us get here today. We have ex er, entered into 6X, the sixth largest extinction event known in the history of life on this planet. But this extinction event is not caused by an asteroid impact. It is caused by an organism, by us. Not only are we the cause of this extinction event, but we're likely to be its victim. But we can do something about that. Now, as part of my lecture series for this, this past year, um, I am greatly honored to have been appointed as an invention ambassador by the American Academy, of, 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 of American, the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. Uh, AAAS is the largest scientific organization in the world. It has about, I think, around 200,000 members. I was surprised that I was nominated. I had to go through a gauntlet of a vetting process. They talked to my supporters. They talked to my critics. They reviewed what I had done. Um, and I was elected along with six other individuals. So there's seven of us invention ambassadors. We go around the country trying to communicate to the public about the role of science in society and invention and advancing technology. Um, and you know, I'm holding the stage here with my other invention ambassadors, including uh, Steve on the, on the very far left, or the very far right. Um, he is the, the inventor of digital photography, so it's really a super great honor to be able to share this position. I just came from the Edison Museum in Orange, uh, New, New Jersey, uh, and we visited Thomas Edison's house, his laboratories, and that was a really fantastic experience for me. I, I grew up in a small town in Ohio, and um, I was the youngest of five kids, and um, we had this amazing laboratory in the basement. And my brother John, who was the, the eldest son, he kind of ran the laboratory, and it was three rows of chemicals, an amazingly cool place. And my father served on the aircraft carrier, the Intrepid, and he got the Intrepid aircraft carrier radio, the main radio from the Intrepid after World War II. We had it in our basement. And so when I was a kid, I was always plugging in these big banks of cathode ray, ray, ray tubes and listening to coded messages behind the Iron Curtain. I was really excited, but my alpha brother, John, would not let me play in the laboratory. He was a serious you know, scientist, and I was just the younger brother. He went on to Yale and went on to the University of Washington um, and on a scholarship in neurophysiology. So when John went off to Yale and my other brothers went away, I had a fully equ equipped laboratory to myself. It was like a, a kid's dream, kid scientist's dream come true. Um, and I always, that made a huge impression on me. And I always thought I really wanted to you know, live in the country and have my own laboratory complex. And I'm actually living my dream today. We have a great a company, a great group of, of other people that help us. We have 65 employees. We have very large laboratories. We produce 20,000 kilos of mycelium per week, sometimes 30,000, sometimes 40,000. So and I have a culture collection now of about 700 strains and species, now many of which come from the old growth forest. So um, my brother John, the alpha brother, younger brother, the dynamic there, you know, he said, Paul, mushrooms aren't really serious science now, you know? Um, and he was, you know, he was, that was his role, you know? Um, and I, so when I got the Inven Invention Ambassador Award, I got really excited, you know, I got, John, I can show you, you know, I've been vetted by the most prestigious scientific organization in the world, you know? This is the most important thing for me is to tell my brother John that I've done it, you know? Because I always wanted to have him look upon me as a younger brother, as being somebody who was really doing something important and, and legitimize my interest in, in, in mushrooms. And so I got real excited and I, I, I ended up um, getting the announcement from my brother, from the AAAS and I emailed my brother and I call him and there's no answer. And that was the day they discovered his body. My brother John died of a cardiac arrest. I don't know if he ever got the email, you know. Um, so I'm dedicating my talks for this past year to my brother John. He's the one who first got me into science. And so this is for you, John. So thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
So the other people that had a great influence on me are these individuals. This is uh, Dr. Uh, Alexander Smith, University of Michigan, Professor Emeritus, Dr. Daniel Stuntz, University of Washington. Um, Kit, uh, Kit Skates from Post Falls, Idaho. Uh, Gary and I and Irene and others here knew them quite well. And then Dr. Michael Bue. These three individuals have now passed on, but it's from their generosity and kindness that I am here and we are here today. And I can't emphasize that more, especially since these individuals were politically conservative in today's context. And when I was um, 21 years of age, this is what I looked like. <laughs> Your suspicions are now confirmed. <laughs> Woo! Okay, so, um, and it, so they took me under their wing and I was very interested in psychoactive mushrooms and I ended up with a specialty, ended up getting a Drug Enforcement Administration license for 10 years and I published several new species in the genus Psilocybe. Uh, Gary and I have been on many mushroom hunts for the, for the Psilocybe mushrooms and it really opened up a whole new arena of experiences on mul multiple levels, as you can imagine. Um, so, but my wife and I, we spend a lot of time in the old growth forest. This is our, the natural laboratory from which we source many of our strains. Um, and I like this photograph a lot because it's a trail of minimum impact through an ecosystem. And a lot of the mushrooms are trail followers. It's very curious about that. We find a lot more mushrooms along the trails than we do deep in the woods. It's like the mushrooms are following us, and I think for very, very good reasons. But let me give you some background in the field of mycology, just so you, we all come from the same understanding. This is a cross-section of an ecosystem, and there are saprophytic fungi that break down uh, dead material. There are the endophytic fungi, and literally hundreds of endophytic fungi can be inside of plants, inside of trees, par running parallel to the stems, uh, cells of, of trees and the leaves. Um, there and there's a mycorrhizal fungi. Many of you know about the mycorrhizal fungi. They're hugely important to plants. Um, they extend the rhizosphere of the plants. And then there's a parasitic fungi that actually kill trees or, 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 or plants. Um, and then when they're killed, then the saprophytic fungi can become, become operational. Well, so when you look at the ecosystems now, and it was really well described in Science Magazine when this article came out that plants are all part fungi. Um, and this is really important for botanical research because so much of the botanical research has been based on extracts of plants. And one has to wonder, what is the contribution of the guilds of fungi, especially the endophytic fungi and the alkaloids they produce? What's the contribution of their, their medicinal properties inside of the plants when these extracts are being made? These are consortia of, of organisms that are, that are using a scaffolding of a plant, but they're actually diverse populations within, living within and upon them. A book that I highly recommend is Mycorrhizal uh, Symbiosis. This is a little pine tree. This is the roots. And this is the, rhizos the, 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 this is the rhizosphere. This is the mycosphere uh, of uh, extending the root zones literally hundreds, if not thousands, of times. With a mycorrhizal fungi, typically they are transferring minerals uh, to the plants and the root zone. And that point specific place when there's a transfer of mineral minerals, the plant uh, through the roots uh, gives a burst of sugar to reward the fungus. And so it's a, it's a bimolecular communication of compounds. Well, this article came out in 2013. It's a fantastic little experiment. It's so simple, but it saddens me that we're at the state of knowledge that we are today just discovering that which we should have discovered hundreds of years ago. Four bean plants. And one bean plant, they're all in different pots. One bean pan, uh, plant is planted and, um, and it grows and they put aphids on it. Well, immediately as a defense reaction, alkaloids are being produced. We can measure these alkaloids. And the three other bean plants that were in separate plots did not produce alkaloids. They were not being threatened by the aphids. When they put all these four bean plants in commonality, so the root zones and the mycelium then interconnected and joined the plants together, when they introduced the aphids to the first plant, the other three plants, not in direct contact with the aphids, upregulated the production of anti-aphid alkaloids as part of their host defense system, protecting them from potential invasion by aphids. This was the first true experiment that showed that plants are communicating via the mycelium through the rhizosphere underground. And so that's an extraordinarily break, a big breakthrough in the field of mycology. We begin to understand that, wow, mycelium is an internet-like communication membrane that these plants are, are using. So very quickly on the mushroom life cycle, uh, mushrooms produce spores, I think we all know that. In most cases, there's two spores that, uh, if, if they're sexually compatible, they mate. The down, downstream mycelium then can produce mushrooms, and the mushrooms grow very quickly, just in a matter of a few days, and then they, they begin to sporulate again, and so this life cycle spins. 
Now, this, the mycelial state can be months, years, decades, uh, perhaps hundreds of years, but the mushroom formation stage is really extremely short. These are the fruit bodies of the mycelium, very similar to the analogy that a peach, for instance, that it ripens, it, it attracts herbivores, it attracts us, it attracts insects, uh, because that peach pit is actually the seed. And so it's designed to attract other animals to help consume it to spread its, its, its progeny. Well, I gave a talk at a permaculture conference, and then I was astonished that, that permaculture scientists did not know this, is mushroom mycelium produces water. 20% of the degradation of straw and sawdust, by oyster mushrooms in this case, liberates water, creates water from a dried substrate. It pulls oxygen out of the air, combines with hydrogen, HCO is being produced, and so the decomposition cycles, and you all know this when you look around a compost pile, you see all that big moisture uh, puddles all around the compost pile. It's a reduction process, but in the process of decomposition, the mushroom mycelium is actually generating water. And it's producing these extracellular metabolites, these little droplets being sweating out from the mycelium. But in these droplets that are predominantly water, there's all sorts of other compounds that we're studying now that is extraordinarily interesting. But going back to the mycorrhizal fungi in particular, this is an example where the mycelium is harvesting minerals from rocks and they produce calcium oxalate crystals. So here's the mycelium, the little droplets are being formed, and there's, uh, there's, uh, there's oxalic acid, and oxalic acid is two carbon dioxide molecules joined together. Now oxalic acid is very reactive, looking for minerals, iron, uh, calcium, molybdenum, manganese, et cetera, and when it does, it pulls them together and forms calcium oxalates. Calcium oxalates, are the, uh, these oxalates are insoluble in water. And so it actually is counterintuitive, but fungi, even though they respire carbon dioxide and they bring in oxygen, they sequester carbon in the soil. And so these, these fungi are very good and eloquent at being able to digest rocks. So when I find a rock walking in the old growth forest, I tip it over, oh, that's nice. There's some mycelium down there because it's cold and it's wet. That's what I thought for a long time. It took me a long time to figure out, no, actually the mycelium is consuming the rocks. And so what you're seeing here is the rock is being consumed by mycelium, probably from a, a mycorrhizal fungus, a mushroom forming fungus, and then channeling these minerals to the plants, which are limited in their foraging abilities for those minerals. Well, the mycelium then can wick, wick to the surface, and mushroom mycelium triggers into mushroom formation according, uh, in response to four environmental stimuli. Well, first is the introduction of water, rain. We, can, we all know that. With rain, we have evaporation, so we have a drop in temperature. That typically occur, occurs when it rains. So there is the introduction of water and drop in temperature. The mycelium then comes to the surface, exhales carbon dioxide, inhales oxygen. So oxygen abundance and low CO2 levels above the ground triggers mushroom formation. And surprisingly, about 98% of all mushrooms that we grow require light. They have no chlorophyll whatsoever, but they're extremely photosensitive, and without light, the mushrooms will not form from the mycelium. So those are the four primary environmental triggers that stimulate mushroom formation from mushroom mycelium. So we did a series of experiments with mycorrhizal fungi, and here is from Mike Amaranthus, a friend of mine. This is without mycorrhizal fungi with, with a little fur seedling. A maple, you know, without uh, mycorrhizal fungi with. This is really commonly known now. You can't buy plant soil really from any nursery without mycorrhizae being incorporated in it. But we started doing some experiments and we found that a single mycelial mat can be host to diverse plant species that are unified by the mantle of the mycelium. And so we got really excited about mycorrhizal fungi and started looking at the research that certainly there must be studies on the uh, benefits of mycorrhizal fungi for agroforestry, for forestry. And I used to work in the woods for a number of years. Um, and so, um, not to get too political here, but I licensed one of my patents for a lot of money. George Bush got elected, so I bought land in Canada. <laughs> um, anyhow, <laughs> it was an opportunity. Um, I didn't know what was gonna happen. but. So anyhow, this is the 160 acres that we bought in Canada, a uh, little, little swamp here, and we told the, the sellers who are loggers, you know, don't, don't replant, don't clean it up, I'll take it over, you know? So my wife and I bought it, and we uh, let the roads be ecological barriers. We planted around 38,000 trees, half of which had mycorrhizal fungi dipped into the root zones, half of which did not, and half of which had uh, uh, wood chips scattered around the base, and half of it did not. It was a four-way experiment. This has been a labor of love. We put 1,100 trees into an Excel spreadsheet, and David Summerlin, David Price, and Jim Gouin, three of my coworkers, really get credit for this because they've done the heavy lifting. And so this, is, this chart here is an enormous amount of data that we have put together. 
And now we have significance. After seven or eight years now, we have substantially increased the growth of the height of the trees as well as the girth. And so we have an accelerating differential here over time. And we had not been able to find anything on this scale where they showed that there may be a better management practice. And the problem with the lumber industry is they used a metric that most of us would not necessarily agree with. Their metric is based on the economics of board t uh, feet of timber, of lumber coming out of the woods. There is no, it's an it's a imbalanced uh, 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 metric because they're not considering clean water, biodiversity, sustainability, the, 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 the sequestration of carbon, um, and none of those things really count. And that's the wrong, we really need to have a new ecological metric that, that we uh, project out into the ecosystem for the ecological benefits and the services that, that forests give us. Um, so this is an experiment, we're going to go on to 10 years, uh, you know, we're going to publish this in a, in a, eventually in a peer-reviewed agroforestry journal showing that there is a better way. Leave the wood chips there on the ground. Don't burn them. I'm opposed to burning except for ex extraordinary circumstances, but we want the carbon to stay on the ground because we can sacrifice them, decompose them, and big, build up the soil later. 12 inches of wood chips will give you one to two inches of soil in about three years if you introduce the fungi that will decompose them. So the mycelium can present itself in many forms. These are just three forms. This is really what I call happy mycelium. It's rapidly growing, it's diverging. Um, it's, and this is what I seek and many of us here in the room are cultivators and we see mycelium running. That's the name of my latest book. Um, then we're really, really, really happy. Well, these mycelial membranes are, um, are not necessarily so small. They can become huge. And this is uh, where I live in Washington State, where we live. This is the Columbia River. And we're going to fly down, and I hired a small airplane and flew down to the John Day Wilderness in search of the largest organism in the world. The largest organism in the world is a mycelial mat from Armillaria astoii, um, now re renamed to a different species, but it's 2,200 acres in size, 1,665 football fields, three feet deep. It's the largest organism in the world and has one cell wall thick. You have five or six, six skin cells that are protecting you from infection. The mycelium has one. Number of scientists here in the, in the audience, we do CFU analysis, colony forming units. How many organisms will grow in a gram of soil? And the good soil has, has hundreds of thousands, if not millions of organisms per gram. So all these hungry microbes are around the mycelium and yet it achieves the largest mass of any organism in the world. How does it do that? It does that because of epigenesis, being able to upregulate gene expressions that give them a host defensive resistance against pathogens. And, and, and as they elaborate these networks, it's in constant biomolecular communication with this ecosystem, extremely sensitive to setting up de de defensive strategies. So again, more happy mycelium. And then um, I, uh, this, this study came out from Japan that's totally extraordinary with a slime mold. And what these, these scientists wanted to see is to prove cellular intelligence. And so what they did is here is Tokyo. These are the cities around Tokyo. And you have a great subway system here. But the scientists wanted to know if a slime mold could redesign the Tokyo subway system. And so here are the slime molds planted. These are oat flakes that represent the cities. The slime molds in the center. At five hours it grows out. 11 hours it grows out. Lots of random branchings here. And then at 26 hours, it shuts down the non-essential branches and redesigns the Tokyo subway system in a more efficient design than it is today. Moreover, when mathematicians analyzed the, 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 the solving of this problem, they found the slime mold achieved optimi optimization. Now, this seems extraordinary, but really, is it? Through natural selection over hundreds of millions of years, the economy of motion, conservation of resources, efficiency through trial and error, why wouldn't the slime mold choose the most efficient route? So I suggest to you, if you have a mathematical problem or engineering pro problem, maybe you should consult a slime mold. So I spent many years as a scanning electron microscopist. So here is the mycelium. And then there's four factors I described um, then come into play. And then the primordia just begin to form. The primordium forms you know, matter just overnight. There's explosions of cells, divisions. And so here's a five-day sequence of oyster mushrooms, day 21 through day 25. That's how quickly they grow. The mushrooms do not have a good immune system. They ripen fruit. They attract insects and, and mycovores. They're designed to rot, but they're sporulating. Good luck to any bacterium that can rot the, the mushroom faster than it can sporulate. 
they don't have a good opportunity. This is the mycelium that's in the ground and direct contact with microbes from which we now can source a lot of very exciting new medicines, antiviral and antibacterials. So here is a, a Agaricus uh, brasiliensis or Agaricus blasii, an almond flavored mushroom that's delicious. I'm one of the co-authors of this. And then we look at, this mush uh, at mushrooms that they rot in the old growth forest. This is a rushless species. It's past its prime, it's beginning to rot. We come back a few days later, the mushrooms, are, the spores are sporulating. Lots of other organisms are also co-inhabiting and growing uh, upon this, this wild mushroom. And then a few days later, the mycelium goes subterranean. It goes underground. It's estimated that in a cubic inch of soil, there can be more than a mile of these fine filaments. My foot covers approximately 300 miles of mycelium. When you walk into the woods and you feel that bounce factor underneath your feet, those, that's mycelial membranes that you're walking upon. Literally every footstep that you take, you're walking across mycelial landscapes. Microscopically, they're highly active that are growing constantly um, um, uh, in the ground. So my friend Patrick Hickey uh, produced this series of movies. And before we did, we did not fully understand that the nuclei stream through the, the, the networks of mycelium. So in a swath of mycelium, the, the width of my arms here, they can literally be hundreds of millions of end branchings. And if they're, if they're branching, they're branching, they're forking, what happens is the tips become polynucleate. Think of them as little scientists, a group of scientists that are at the tips of the mycelium. And if they combine to produce a new enzyme to break down a new, new food source, a toxin, a human-made toxin, a, a new insect, a new piece of wood, a, you know, a hydro carbon, then if the myce mycelium is successful in genetically upregulating a new gene expression or getting one that's latent, latent to express itself, then what happens, the mycelium then surges and captures that nutrition. Well, then it becomes genet genetically educated because that now the enzymatic sequence that was successful in getting it food now becomes resident within the memory of the mycelial map. So the mycelium can be trained very, very quickly to adapt. Fungi adapt to catastrophia. And this is really important because I think we're the biggest walking catastrophe on the planet today. And this is one of the reasons why I think mycelium runs after us as we walk through the woods and we're breaking wood chips. The mycelium is leaping in our aftermath because competition in newly made material, it's learned that when animals cross habitats and break materials underneath their feet, it's an opportunity for a banquet of food. I'm gonna wax poetic here, but I think now since my brother's death, a lot about our own mortality. And so this is something I truly deeply believe in. The mycelium conforms to an archetype very similar to that of neurons in the human brain. The invention of the computer internet, and this is the computer internet model as, as shown here, I believe is an inevitable consequence of a previously proven evolutionary successful model. The way of nature and evolution is to build upon prior successes and prior models. And so the mycelium in, the, in our brains, the computer internet, and then I'm an amateur astronomer going way out. This is the cobweb of dark matter from a deep, deep field view from the, from the Hubble telescope. And the organization of dark matter also conforms to that uh, uh, shared by the same archetype of that of the mycelium in the brain and the computer internet. Well, mo many of you may have heard there are estimated now more than 500 million Earth-like planets within the Milky Way in the Goldilocks zone where there's liquid water. This is astonishing. I believe matter begets life. Life becomes single cells. Single cell stream linearly. Then they branch. Membranes begin to form. Interlacing mosaics of membranes then cooperate or compete. And this is the way of nature. We will find network-based organisms throughout the universe. So, and going way far out, this is from the Discovery Channel. This is now the most extensive view of the universe that you can, they can model. And this is all those galaxies all together, including dark matter. And you look at this, and this looks exactly to us mycologists like mycelium. If I showed this image to a mycologist, they would typically say, wow, this great looking mycelium, where did it come from? Well, in the mycelium, when we do fermentation, this is also exactly what it looks like. And this is, this is also from discovery, showing the cobweb of dark matter, and it also forms the same archetype. I hypothesize, and I'm impossible to prove hypothesis. Are we looking at 
the construct of universal consciousness. We all will die. We're all made of stardust. We will all demolecularize. We will all remolecularize into a different form. This is not so bad. This is the continuum of existence of which we're all a part. But we have some strange thing called a brain that interferes us with the gestaltic experience of living in a spiritual existential universe that we're a part of. 13.8 billion years ago, the universe, and after the Big Bang, the universe formed. There's a massive amount of debris. 4.5 billion years ago, the Earth coalesced. 3.8 billion years ago, according to the fossil record, the first life forms emerged. Then we march forward, and 420 million years ago, this organism exists. This is a fossil found in Saudi Arabia in 1859, given the name Prototaxides. Prototaxides was a huge mystery to, our, to, 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 to scientists for a long time. Standing up is the tallest organism in the world. This is before vascular plants, before trees and shrubs. Uh, ferns existed, but this is before flying insects. And so the tallest organisms in the world at that time, 420 million years ago, were less than three feet tall. This is about 10 meters or 35 feet long. It's found in Saudi Arabia. It's found in various regions of the world. And product societies, the, the mystery of it was finally solved by Kevin Boyce, who published an article in the Journal of Geology, I think around 2012, 2013. Kevin Boyce was able to use uh, analysis uh, using carbon dating and was able to determine the, you know, definitively that Prototaxides was a giant fungus, likely standing up, towering over the landscape, the tallest organism in the world. They had Prototaxides fungi all over the landscape that would attract lightning strikes, insects like the would have burrowed in here for food, epigenesis, rapid evolution, you know, lots of things, you know, will be happening, you know, from the inter interface of these organisms taking advantage of prototaxides product as a food source. So this still remains a large mystery. We've never found the spores. We don't know if it's had a cap. This is like a shaggy mane, you know, and this is the stem. Very, very possible. It may have been that. So any graduate students here who want a great project at the Chicago Field Museum is where prototaxides is, I would love for some graduate students to thin section the rock that, is, that Project Exides is embedded in to look for ancient spores. I think that'd be a great graduate project. So we go from 420 million years ago, we advance to the time of Pangaea, 250 million years ago, when all the continents were connected, then a huge extinction event occurred. And there's competing theories. One is an asteroid impact that hit the Earth, possible huge amounts of debris were jettisoned in the atmosphere, the other one is your, uh, uh, volcanoes in Eurasia or methane hydrate bursts out of the ocean. I don't see these as being mutually exclusive. The asteroid impact could have created the earthquakes that created the fissures to release the methane hydrate burst and cause volcanoes to burst. Nevertheless, the earth was shrouded in dust. Sunlight was cut off. Massive extinction and die off of plants and animals. And fungi inherited the earth. In fact, we go forward now to 65 million years ago. And actually, we go back to 250 million years ago, and the asteroid impact is likely. And we actually have found and named the fungus that gobbled up the forest. It's called Reduvio sporonides. This is the most common fungus found in the fossil record inside of, of uh, decomposed fossilized wood debris. Um, and so the, the forests were gobbled up. We had, you know, the skies eventually cleared. We go forward to 140 million years ago to the, to the, the time of Gondwana land. And now we have separation of the continents. We have continental drift. We go forward to 65 million years ago. Bam! We have another asteroid impact, another huge extinction event. Now, it's pretty clear what happened. The dinosaurs became extinct. And it, the, the asteroid impact, as most of you know, was in the Yucatan. But the repetition of this extinction event had the same commonality of huge amounts of debris, jettisoned in the atmosphere, sunlight cut off, massive extinction, and fungi re-inherited the Earth. There's a recurring theme here, folks. We have entered into 6X, the sixth greatest extinction event on life on this planet that we know so far. And those organisms that paired with fungi, little voles in the ground that had fungal sources of nutrition, those organisms that paired with fungi had a better chance of surviving extinction. We are at that cusp right now. And what I'm proposing to you is a series of mycotechnologies 
that can open up doors, especially for future generations, that help us forestall or overcome or survive our extinction event that we're incurring now. So here's my manly man photograph. <laughs> This is, I, I like decomposing wood. This is where I, I go in the old growth forest. I like re I mean really big logs, because many of these fungi that you know, Gary and I, and many of the people in this room that collect, these environments with lots of decomposing wood sport a lot of mushrooms. But I'm mostly focused on saprophytic fungi. And so we take wood chips, we add mycelium, lots of things happen, but ultimately we create soil. So um, fungi are the grand molecular decomposers of nature the soil magicians. We create soil and the con consequence of decomposition over a period of a few months spins out nutrient life cycles that fuel many other organisms. And in the process of decomposition, I knew that red wiggly worms were very mycophagous, they like to eat fungi, but I looked in the scientific literature. Well, certainly someone has done a choice test with red worms on their preferences for myceliated straw versus non-myceliated straw or myceliated sawdust. Certainly someone has done that. Of course. No. I've surveyed the scientific literature, the popular literature. As far as I know, no one has ever done this. So we set up a choice test with straw, same moisture content, same straw, with mycelium, without mycelium, seven repetitions, 100 worms at a time, painstakingly counted and put in the center here. 24 hours later, we would then count how many worms had migrated uh, into each side super high significance, and we showed a very strong preference of worms following the path of mycelium. Well, I think this is really important. We need to know the way of the worm in rendering soils that are so important for our biosphere. Well, let me take you back into some of the research that we were doing. In 1984, I bought a small farm, 17 acres um, here on Skookum Inlet. There are salmon runs and steelhead runs coming through this inlet, salt water. The main industry is, is the shellfish industry, uh, clams and oysters. And so I bought this farm, um, didn't have all these other buildings at the time, but I had cows, chickens, and pigs, one horse. And I was, bought this farm, I was really excited, a small little hobby farm, I bought it from an elderly lady. And, um, and I had the farm and I, this is great. And about a week after I bought the farm, the sheriff shows up. I went, wow, that's awfully quick. <laughs> time to do anything illegal yet. Uh, <clears throat> so I got served a summons, as did everybody else on this inlet, saying that you had to replace your septic system, because we didn't have one, within two years with a certified inspected septic system or you'd be physically evicted off your property. Well, I couldn't afford to put in a $25,000 septic system. But I could, was very fascinated in growing mushrooms and wood chips. So in a swale below where all the poop was coming down from the animals, the lower part of my field, there was a depression where water came through, so I put in a bed of wood chips and I inoculated the wood chips with mycelium of the garden giant mushroom. Well, one year later, a fleet of government officials show up again in my driveway, and they said, Paul Stamets, we have to talk to you. We've measured the water coming off your property and all the other properties on this inlet. Did you replace your septic system? I go, no. And he says, well, we have a two log reduction in E. coli, you know, coliform, thermotolerant coliform bacteria. I said, what did you do? Obviously, your animal's more than double. The bio burden is much higher. What did you do? And I said, well, I said, I put in beds of wood chips and I grew this garden giant mushroom that really loves the contact with soil, so I think it has an appetite for bacteria. Well, that was the dawn of mycofiltration. And so the mycelium grows to the wood chips, incredibly tenacious. Now, these wood chips are full of bacteria, but the mycelium is tenacious, it's holding the wood chips together. It smells delicious. It's one of the things that us mycologists use as a scent of smell. We can identify some species by the mycelium alone, just from the scent, the scents of fragrances. And the mycelium, you know, grows through the environment and it becomes a mycofiltration membrane. So it captures nutrients as it's flowing through and like a net. But the mycelium is extracellularly producing digestive juices to break down nutrients and selectively brings the nutrients that wants, wants directly through the cell walls. So these are externalized stomachs. We share a, Marco, uh, a, cl a closer evolutionary relationship with fungi than we do with any other kingdom. 650 million years ago, we diverged from fungi. Fungi chose the route of going underground, externally digesting its nutrients. We went the route of encirculating our nutrients in the cellular sac, basically a stomach. In both cases, we selected out microbiomes, 
uh, microbial allies, bacteria in particular, to help us create guilds of cooperating organisms that help us succeed together as a community. Well, this is really important because the mycelium is not only an externalized stomach, they're externalized lungs. As I mentioned, they exhale um, uh, uh, CO2, they inhale oxygen. And I believe that these are externalized neurological networks. These are sentient networks. So a new super kingdom has been erected called a Pistacanta, joining animalia and fungi together, published in the Journal of Eukaryotic Microbiology several years ago, recognizing our close affinity in relationship with fungi. And our best antibiotics fighting bacteria come from fungi. They're very helpful for us. But we have very few good antifungal antibiotics because they're so toxic to us because of our close evolutionary relationship. So looking at these digestive um, um, droplets now and these enzymes, we started setting up a series of experiments. And I just like to say, it's not fair that it took me 35 years to discover this, and I'm telling you this in five minutes. But <laughs> what we found is cold ambient temperature fermentation. And we put wood chips or straw in water, and we let it sit in stagnant water for about two weeks. Bubbles start forming, a bacterial slime forms. We're not bubbling anything in there. We let it have, be in stagnant water. Predominantly, it becomes uh, 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 full of anaerobic bacteria. And so the anaerobic bacteria become highly predominant, and then after two weeks, then we lay the wood chips uh, outside on a tarp, and oxygen becomes a sterilizer, and it kills the anaerobes. And then we inoculated the mycelium directly into this bacterial rich you know, wood chips. The mycelium being aerobic then has a competitive advantage and runs like crazy. So this is a low tech method that can be practiced anywhere in the world and the implications I think are huge. There's no laboratories involved in this. So we're gonna watch just a very short little uh, one minute movie here. So this is what the mycelium looks like in those totes my hand is on. And then we plant it outside, and the mycelium is temporary. It only lasts for a few months, six, six months to a year. If, they if there's more debris added to them, then, then they continue their growth. But looking at the mycelium under the microscope, and, uh, and analyzing the types of bacteria that co-inhabit, many of which are, are parasitic, it became very clear that mushrooms and, and humans share in common many of the same uh, 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 microbial pathogens that afflict us also afflict mushrooms. So we hold that in common. Well, we did something that I had never seen in the scientific literature. I know no literature reports even today. We then decided to analyze the microbiome. 
We took the same wood chips, the fermentation, same, same blue tote. We inoculated the garden giant in one and Urpex lacteus in another. This is a resupinate polypore. It's really active at breaking down hydrocarbons and lots of toxins. Um, and then we sequenced uh, the bacterial communities in each. And we, uh, 500 species were in the database of bacteria. And we found something astonishing. There was more than a thousand-fold difference in the relative abundance of bacteria uh, associated with the garden giant mushroom versus uh, the Urpex lacteus. This had never been shown before. The mycelium sets up the stage of microbiomes that are distinctly unique to the mushroom mycelium that is decomposing the wood chips, I believe, in order to set up the stage of the microbial population that benefits the plants that give rise to the trees that creates the canopy and the debris fields that feed the mycelium. They are deterministic gateway species that set the stage for ecological recovery and the evolution of habitats that are beneficial to its own progeny enlisting the microbiome allies specific to its community that can help us achieve that task. This, I think, is revolutionary. It shows you a gateway that we can purposely insert different species as keystone species that lead to habitat recovery anywhere in the world. So we have now about 15 sites on microfiltration, one in Lake, uh, up on Lake Erie in New York. Um, and we have done many projects here. We received a phase one EPA grant. Um, and we found uh, that 20% of the E. coli uh, per two-thirds of a cubic foot by the garden giant mushroom reduced uh, E. coli. Um, and so one of our peer reviewers, um, Phil, if we could focus on this, it would be great, a little bit better focus. So one of our peer reviewers said, uh, well, how do you know if you're not wa putting water through wood chips, you're not extracting tannins? Tannins can be a, a, toxic, a, a toxic chemical. And uh, so, very good, very good question. So here is a, a, the, the same uh, uh, water uh, going through uh, uh, alder chips with mycelium, alder chips without mycelium. Without the mycelium, the tannins come through. With the mycelium, they're decolorized, they're captured. And so not only can the garden giant uh, mushroom eliminate E. coli, it also can break down many other toxins. So we then went ahead and published this. We have three articles in the peer-reviewed literature. Be more, more than happy to send it to any of you. Uh, it's up on our website at fungi.com, or you can write us at info at fungi.com. I'm more than happy to be able to, to provide this. So it's, this was a, the first peer-reviewed articles that we've found, we've done on uh, microfiltration using the garden giant mushroom, which I think is an exceptional species, not only because it comes to it large, um, but I was a marine biologist. I actually uh, raised salmon fry from, from eggs into smolts and released them. I started a salmon run. Um, and I, I was, had silver salmon, and I fed these mushrooms to my silver salmon. Uh, the mushrooms are gorged with, with maggots and fly larvae. The hollow, the stems become hollow, and I threw them into the fish tanks and waited a few hours, and then, um, ooh, okay. And then um, the mushrooms would float in the, in the tanks. The larvae then would start drowning. They would come out of the floating mushrooms, and the salmon would go bam, bam, bam. By the third or fourth day, when I threw in one of these garden giant mushrooms, they're like piranhas. They would hit the mushrooms so intensely. I said, well, certainly someone has figured, published on this before. Again, I surveyed the scientific literature, no publications. And it may be the riparian zones around uh, streams and rivers work because the debris fields being generated by the trees that, that enable the mycelium to grow, that then produce mushrooms where fly larvae come in, they grow, and that, those fly larvae then get washed into the streams. So this is yet another example. So I've been talking about you know, I believe that habitats have immune systems just like we, we do. And so this is kind of the, 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 the immune systems of habitats where fungi come into play. And then I will look at some of the, the mushrooms that are, are used uh, medicinally. This is in Scotland. This is a beech tree. And this is like the biggest chaga I've ever seen. The chaga is an amorphous mass of hardened tissue. Some people call it a sclerotium, but it's really not. And it grows on birch trees. And it grows on beech trees. Um, it follows the doctrine of signatures in ancient times where the form of the, the plant or the mushroom speaks to its utility. So it kind of looked like a cancerous tumor and it was used for treating, treating cancer. Well, this mushroom is extremely hard. And so you, our ancestors used to boil it in hot water. Well, boiling it in water is, is a good way to extract, but keep in mind that water is a very polar solvent. And so it can extract the beta-glucans, the glycoproteins, the polysaccharides, et cetera, using water. But in doing so, you partition out the lipids and the non-soluble compounds, the sterols, the lipids, some of the terpenes, which are not highly water-soluble. So 
boiling mushrooms in water is a great extraction technique that our ancestors used to detoxify the mushroom and to extract out some of their important nutrients. But by, do so, by doing so, you partition away these other non-water soluble constituents. And this is the area that we have really focused in on in a big way. So I am stating to you publicly, I really want people to be very concerned about the wild harvesting of chaga. People are going out into the forest with hatchets and machetes. They're scarring the trees. It's a money grab to try to get as much chaga as you can. A few years ago, I could get 500 kilos of chaga if I wanted to out of China and Russia. Now you're lucky to get five kilos. And as the chaga is chopped off the trees, it leaves a soft wound exposed to mycelium that's attractive to beetles. So insect invasion can occur, whereas the chaga was in, a resident there is extremely hard. So this group of researchers in, in Korea I did a study showing that twice hot water extracted chaga protected DNA from free radical damage by more than around 40%. Unbeknownst to us, they got our chaga extract grown from mycelium, not from the hard, hard uh, amorphous you know, clump. And then they published this in a, in a British uh, medical journal. And they found that the British researchers found that the water ethanol ambient temperature extraction of the mycelium uh, resulted in a 55% uh, uh, protection of free, uh, from free radicals of, uh, in terms of, of DNA damage and with extraordinarily high significance. And so I think this is a proof positive that you can grow the mycelium, which is sustainable. You just need a tiny fragment of, of a mushroom the size of your fingernail and you can grow hundreds of thousands of kilos of mycelium without raping the, the, the forest because we need to preserve the genetic uh, uh, library of the forest ecosystem. The, the micro library in the ecosystem is extremely important. So that's one example of a medicinal mushroom, but this mushroom really opened up the gates. This is Enokitake, many of you know this as a small needle mushroom, uh, Flamulina uh, volutipes or Flamulina populicula. Um, and this mushroom was widely cultivated and consumed in Asia. And Dr. Ikikawa was a scientist working as an epidemiologist for the National Cancer Center in Tokyo. And when he uh, was looking at the map of cancer deaths throughout Japan, there was a dearth, significantly, a drop in cancer rate in the Nagano Prefecture. Now, there's about 160 uh, cancer deaths uh, per 100,000 individuals of all, from all cancers per year in, in Japan. And in, America, in the United States, we're around 190 or so. But this is uh, what the ambient uh, uh, death rate is across Japan. And he went to the Nagano Prefecture and he studied for several years. And then he focused in on the fact that there was a lot of enoki mushrooms being cultivated there. And those of us who are, grow uh, gardens or have farms, you don't sell the blemished ones. You eat those for yourself or your family. They may have a wormhole in it or insect damage or bacterial blotch. You cut that out and you consume it. You can't present it to the public. So you naturally consume a lot more per capita of the mushroom than the general public would. They had about eight times the national, the national consumption per capita of enoki mushrooms. And here's the result of Dr. Ikikawa's work and over a population of 174,000 individuals, statistically significant drop across the board of all types of cancers. This was published in a Western medical journal and it was the first article, I think, that opened up Western medical practitioners to the fact that mushrooms could help this immune system as a systematic approach for bolstering, bolstering immunity. So from that, a protein-bound polysaccharide called flamulin was derived and named after flamulina, just like penicillin is named after penic penicillin. Um, so that was the first article that opened things up. There's been a long history of consumption of mushrooms all over the world, especially in Asia. And this, I propose to you, may be the first smart mushroom. This is lion's mane, Herbicium arenaceus. We grow lots of it in the mycelial stage as well as the mushroom forming stage. But there is, there is two clinical studies that show mild cognitive improvement from taking one gram of this mushroom per day. And after three to four months, uh, uh, patients that were experiencing cognitive dysfunction and going into dementia had measurably significant improvements in memory and cognition. That article was the two, two studies in Japan, albeit small clinical studies. But this one study here in particular is very fascinating to me. This is a mouse study, but let me ex explain how it worked. In an arena, 100 mice were put into an arena and it had a door. And don't go down the corridor, it's called a Y test. The left goes to the food, right didn't, went to, didn't go to any food. So the 100 mice immediately figured out very quickly, go left, you get food. So they would do that. And they would chart how many times and how long it would take them. Then they injected a polypeptide that induced amyloid plaque formation and demyelination. 
destroying the myelin sheath on the axons of nerves that interfered with nerve transmission. Progressively, those mice, so they went into full-blown dementia as the amyloid plaque built and the myelin sheath was destroyed. Then the mice then became progressively confused and eventually randomized. They came to a wide choice and they didn't know which way to go. And they went 50-50 to both, both sides. Very, they sacrificed the mice, look at the brain, sure enough, the amyloid plaque had formed. This is what happens when an Alzheimer's patient also is diagnosed. They can see the amyloid plaque formation, the demyelination. Well, then they did another experiment. And this experiment is really cool. It's called the novelty test. And they put the 100 mice in an arena, and they put a new toy in the arena. The mice got really excited. New toy, they would sniff it, they'd smell it, they'd go up to it. They had uh, stopwatches and counters, the duration of contact and how many contacts were made. Huge database they created. Did the same thing. Injected the, the polypeptide amyloid plaque uh, f f forming toxin into those mice. And then after several weeks, they became disoriented. When a new object was put into, the, into, into their arena, they had no interest, no exploratory curiosity. They ignored it. They did like they didn't see it. They sacrificed those mice. They also had the amyloid plaque. With both sets of those mice, they began to feed them lion's mane. And both sets of those at 23 to 28 days, after full-blown dementia-like systems, uh, symptoms, the amyloid plaque had formed, both those groups of mice regained the ability to find the why test, to find the food, and regain their curiosity and exploration uh, interest, and renormalize within about 90% of baseline. Upon sacrificing the mice, the amyloid plaque had largely resolved, remyelination occurred, and this mushroom has been found to have the strongest nerve growth stimulant factors practically found in medicine as of, as of about five years ago, causing the regeneration of myelin. This may be the first smart mushroom. The great tragedy of our elders is they have a body intellect of knowledge accumulated over a lifetime, and then they are, lose their ability to remember. And we lose a transmission of knowledge and then it's a great tragedy, and it's an increasingly a great tragedy. Even though we're getting better at curing different types of cancer, the death rate from Alzheimer's-related diseases is skyrocketing. This is from the Alzheimer's Association. This is a population of the planet today, approximately, that's over the age of 65, about 20% of the population, largely centered in Japan, in Norway, Sweden, Spain, France, some parts of Europe. This is what it looks like in 2050. We have an age bubble hitting the planet. This is going to stress future generations. And so this is something that's extremely important. We've been working with Emory Medical School as an Alzheimer's Institute. We did a comparative analysis to see the amount of iridescenes that were present in different strains of mushrooms that we collected. And then we also looked at, at, at Hericium corolloides, a related uh, uh, lion's mane-like mushroom, as well as, as, as Hericium albiatus. So, uh, this, there are no U.S. clinical studies yet. I know there's a number of physicians in the audience. These, these mushrooms are considered grass, generally regarded as safe. Um, they have a multi-thousand year history of consumption, but this is something that I would encourage all of you to really carefully consider. The consumption of lion's mane mushrooms may prevent dementia. The operative word is may. We have preliminary evidence, but the evidence is pretty strong, signaling that there's likely to be a positive outcome. So, my brother Bill is a very smart guy. He eats lion's mushrooms. Need I say more, right? So um, anyhow, we were funded by NIH for a $2.2 million breast cancer clinical study. I was one of the principal investigators. I co-wrote the grant with a number of other researchers at the University of Minnesota Medical School and Bastyr Medical College. Well, when we got the $2.2 million award from NIH, the, the, my researcher, fellow researcher said, well, Paul, where should we get the mushrooms? You're the mycologist. And I go, well, get them from us. You know, there's so many problems, you know, and the cultivation of, my, of mycelium. The, the mycelium can unravel. It can go from like a, like a nylon sock to a tennis net. If you don't take care of it, you're not going to get the surface area of the active constituents. And I said, get them from us. I said, well, how do we know? You know, you can't be a principal investigator and a supplier. There's a conflict of interest. Do one or the other. So I resigned as a principal investigator, and they said, well, how do we know your mushrooms are better than anybody else's? So they put us in a pool, did some experiments. We came out number one, thankfully. We had a chain of custody. We could be, be inspected. We had a, a cultural library that's traceable. And so then we were the sole source supplier chosen for this breast cancer clinical study. Now, this is important on multiple levels. 73% of all cancer drugs uh, origins in natural products. 41% of us are, will get detectable cancer. 21% of us in this room, one out of five of us currently will die from cancer. Nature is a numbers game. 
How many coefficient multiplier, uh, multipliers will, can you have on this side of the equation, the end consequence which on the other side of the equation will result in your health or disease? We all have cancer all the time. So if you're exposed to toxins in the environment, bad food, stress, genetic factors, you know, mutations caused from various sources, you know, it, it challenges your immune system. And your immune system can't hold all these diseases in check. And so the breast cancer is a clinical study has been published now. And this is a summary chart of the upregulation of the immune system as by, measured by natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells. So this is giving the patients prior to radiation um, no treatment at all, three grams and six grams of turkey tail mycelium uh, grown on rice. And then directly after radiation, your immune system's impaired, it's been damaged, most of you know that. Um, you're more susceptible to infection. Um, and then the, taking these, uh, the turkey tail mushrooms at those levels, there's a stepwise, in, a stepwise introduction in the immune function. Um, and the increase of natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells, highly significant on a dose-dependent basis. Well, this is extraordinarily positive good news. It showed that these mushrooms could be used as adjuncts to conventional therapy to upregulate the immune system because most physicians have nothing for the immune system. They tell you to avoid stress and, and, and toxins and get lots of rest and eat healthy foods, but they really don't have anything to help your immune system be, be uh, more, more uh, on guard. Well, this became incredibly important to me in, um, in June of 2009 when my mother came to me, and my mother was 83 at, the, at that time, and my mother came to me and she says, Paul, and she called me up, and I couldn't even recognize her voice. There's this woman on the other side crying, on the phone, crying and sobbing, and, and I said, who is this? And I said, this is your mother. And I said, what's wrong, Mom? And I thought she had a car accident or something tragically you know, terrible happened to her. And she goes, Paul, I wanted to talk to you, but you're always so busy. I go, well, what's wrong? And she goes, my right breast this is five times the size of my left. I have six angry lymph nodes in my right side. So she goes, I'm scared. She hasn't seen a doctor since 1968. She's a charismatic Christian. They came through, some charismatic Christian scientists came through the Lamarsky dark, dark, dark field microscope. They prayed on her and they said she was cured. I said, oh my gosh, mom, you know, we got to get you to, to, to the cancer clinics as soon as possible in Seattle. We went to the Swedish Cancer Center. I drove my mother there. We went and met, the, met with the doctor, the oncologist, and the second visit she gave, the oncologist gave us the worst news that we could expect or had, had feared. And she said, you know, Patty, my, my mom, your cancer is highly advanced. It's advanced stage four. Her tumor was erupting through her breast across the meridian. It invaded her sternum. It went into her liver. It was highly metastasizing into her lymph nodes. And we all wanted to know, well, what can we do? She goes, you can't have radiation therapy. Your immune system's too, too, too low. You're likely to get an infection. It's not ethical for us to, 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 to recommend radiation therapy. Uh, you, you, you can't have surgery and mastectomy for the same reason. You get an infection. And the oncologist, she has very good bedside, bedside manner. She said, she held her hands and said, you know, it's time. It's time for you to make plans. This is your time. And we said, well, how much time do we have? And she goes, maybe three months. You should have been treated several years ago. Oh. And so we go back, we have the circle meeting. Many of you gone through this. My mother chose the hymns for a funeral. She chose a pink dress. She chose a pine casket, the cheapest that she could buy because her body was going to Jesus into heaven. She didn't need it. She's an incredible woman. And then on our third visit, the doctor said, your cancer is getting worse. There's really nothing we can do. But she goes, if your immune system could kick into gear, it might help you. And there's an interesting turkey tail mushroom study going on at the University of Minnesota Medical School and Bestia Medical College in Seattle. You might want to start taking turkey tail mushrooms. And as my mother turned to the doctor and said, well, my son's been talking about that. But my mother had to hear it from a doctor. <laughs> so my mother started taking eight turkey tail capsules per day. She was put on Taxol briefly, had a horrific reaction to it. And then she, she was put on Herceptin, a wonderful drug. She was put on Herceptin, and she was also put on turkey tail. That was in June of 2009. She was given less than three months to live. And I want to share this with you. This is a phone call that I received just recently.
My mother has crossed the six-year, five-year disease-free period. There is, I feel there's no greater honor than a son coming to the rescue of the mom. Now, my mother's case was extraordinarily interesting. It's called a best case outcome. So she's been written up in several medical journals. And these medical uh, uh, analyses were done. They interviewed the doctor, they interviewed me, they interviewed my mom. And the, the doctor, Julie Smith here, um, uh, when she was asked about my mother's case, uh, she said, asked some questions that I never thought to ask. Uh, Julie, uh, Julie Smith, the oncologist, said, you know, Patty was very interesting. She had no nausea, she had no chem brain, she had no loss of appetite. Three things that also many cancer patients experience. And the lack of good nutrition is thought to be immunologically depressing. Um, also, so the, there's a nu nu nutritional factor here. Um, and then the Julie Smith, um, and she, my mother was being treated in Seattle and at the Swedish Cancer Clinic in Seattle. And then the, her septum program she got put on was in Ellensburg, Washington, because she lived over the mountains in eastern Washington. So she entered and enrolled into a new oncology program, treatment program there. And my mother asked me, should I tell my doctor I'm taking turkey tail? I said, oh, please don't. The doctors out of an abundance of caution will say no, stop everything else, let's see if their treatment works. So my mother entered into her septum program with 50 other ladies. My mother today is the only, 48 of those ladies have died. My mother's the only one that has survived with one other lady, last we heard, she still had tumors. I don't know if she's alive today. So, you know, doctors are oftentimes struggling to find the best treatment. But if they're not familiar with the scientific literature on medicinal mushrooms, then out of an abundance of caution, they'll tell you no to stop. Julie Smith, her doctor, my, my mother, and myself, and other physicians that I know who are familiar with this case, believe that was a life and death decision. The turkey tail mushrooms enabled the, uh, her immune system to rebound. And in fact, her case uh, stimulated this study that showed that PSK, which comes from turkey tail mushrooms, enhances the activity of Herceptin. So the chemotherapeutic drugs would be used at a lower dose and have a, a better effect. So that was cool, um, <laughs> you think? Um, so then there's a series of articles started coming out, and this really got me really excited. It turned out that turkey tail mushrooms uh, are prebiotic to the microbiome, um, down uh, suppressing inflammatory bacteria and enhancing beneficial bacteria, bifidiobacterium uh, and, and acidophilus. So this makes perfectly good sense. The microbiome of the fungi affects your microbiome. And think of it this way. There's 150,000 species of mushroom form fungi in a genome of about one point five million species of fungi. It's about 150,000 species out there. We've identified 14,000. Well, over literally tens of millions of years, our ancestors were forest people. And we would go into the forest and they would try different mushroom species, like taking library books uh, out, of the, uh, out of nature's library. Um, and, and some of these mushrooms were edible, great. They helped fight starvation. Some were poisonous. Ooh, Uncle Harry died. Don't eat that mushroom. You know, you know some were psychedelic. Woo, I see God. I think I'll become a priest, you know. So these mushrooms had these effects. So we were able to call it down to about 200 species through trial and error of our ancestors. Of those 200 species, about 50 of them are highly medicinal. And I suggest to you the hypothesis that those of you who love mushrooms and those of you who do not like mushrooms, those of you who can't stomach them, it could be because of the incompatibility of your microbiome. But we know now that these mushrooms enhance immunity. And we selected a, the, from this large library of potential candidates down to a very, very small subset. Well, we applied for another NIH grant. I wrote it with Haling Yu, who is, who is a MD, PhD from the University of Washington Medical School. The grant was only eight pages long. Um, it was only for about $200,000, $250,000, but we wanted to create a model that any physician, anyone in the world could see the different immune pathways that mushrooms could be analyzed for. Now, it gets complicated because if physicians are trained on mushrooms and fungi being toxins, and they're called toll-like receptors, you consume a mushroom and your immune system says, oh, you have a pathogen, upregulate your immune system to fight the pathogen. 
That's really archaic, but that's the standard model that most immunologists and physicians who never taught about the benefits of fungi, uh, the molds and antibiotics, but never taught about the benefits of mushrooms in med school. You know, fungi were sources of disease and, and, and mycoses. So and there are seven different pathways. A number of physicians here in the audience, I work a lot with different physicians. So besides the TLR2 and TLR4 pathways, there's the upregulation of the P21 and P53 pathways that create tumor regression proteins. There is the suppression of aromatase and 5-alpha reductase for breast and prostate cancer. Um, and these mushrooms have very strong antiviral um, properties and anti-inflammatory properties. These mushrooms enhance immune activity without causing inflammation which is called not to be an oxymoron. Typically, when you get an infection, your immune system activates and you have inflammation at the same time. These mushrooms show, uh, uh, choose a different route. So that steered me into looking at oncoviruses. Number of viruses cause cancer. Most of you know about this. Hepatitis can cause liver cancer. HPV can cause cervical cancer. But you may not know about the polyoma virus that uh, causes Merkel cell carcinoma. <clears throat> Merkel cell carcinoma is a death sentence. It's 99.99999% fatal. The, uh, there's a certain genetic composition, your gene sequences you're born with, two severe sunburns when you're a teenager or a child, and you have a 75% chance of getting Merkel cell carcinoma, highly metastasizes, the tumor grows so fast that the oncologists I talk to say you can practically watch them grow. There is no treatment or cure. And only 10 people in the world have ever survived. Fred Hutch Cancer Center calls me up one day, says, Paul Stamets, we need for you to come up here. We have a very unusual patient. And said, we want to talk to you about Merkel cell carcinoma. So I went up the learning curve very quickly with them, went into a room with 15 oncologists and five histologists. And they had one patient, a 58-year-old patient, who was consuming a seven mushroom species blend. And he spontaneously, his, his tumors went away. And they had nothing to, no, they, all they could do is resect and put the, the tumors in thin sections in wax. So they have a retroactive clinical library of everyone who dies. But they analyzed them, they analyzed them, and he said, well, you know, I was taking this mushroom product, you know, and, and it seems to have worked. So the oncologists, they have, you know, they're, they're, they become really, you know, emotionally attached to these patients. They see them all die in about two years. And so this patient was taking a seven mushroom species blend, and we did a study at a Japanese hospital showing that seven species together increased natural killer cell activity better than any one species times seven. We believe a field of receptor sites are being flooded with these compounds. They lock and load, immune response is activated, but not all the receptors dovetail with all the mushroom molecules in the same way. So the idea is complexity. So this is from Dr. Paul Nim. I give him credit for this. These are his, uh, this is from this patient uh, that, uh, that survived. It's immune evasion. The immune system is active with most of these cancer patients, but the tumors cloak themselves from immune discovery. So the immune cells cannot find docking points on the stroma of the tumors. Subsequently, this 58-year-old male, then consuming the mushrooms, the immune system was able to, find, to uh, invade the tumors, this is a big tumor, these are white blood cells here, find receptors on the stroma of the tumor and be able to invade the tumor and scavenge it away. This patient is alive and healthy today. And he is one of the only 10 documented cases in the world. I call it the NIM hypothesis, that the mushrooms decloak the tumors for immune discovery. The tumors are secreting these proteins that, this, that tell the immune system, don't, don't bother us, we're fine, we're healthy cells. It looks like the mushrooms then decloak the tumors for immune discovery. So that led me into oncoviruses. And other things led me into oncoviruses. So here's my wife, Dusty, and I. We're hunting, hunting mushrooms in the old growth forest. And agaricon is a mushroom that we're focused on. You saw it at the beginning of my talk. Those of you who have my second book, The Mushroom Cultivator, published in 1983, I created agaricon press. That's how long I've been focused on this rare mushroom that grows in the old growth forest. Well, I was publishing on this. National Geo Geographic Magazine heard about this. They gave me an award called the, 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 uh, a Green Inventor Award. And they wanted to do a story on me. So they said, you know, now when I go out in the old growth forest, how likely is it I find these mushrooms? It's really one out of a hundred times. They're that rare. 
And so I go in the old growth forest a lot, but they're extremely hard to find. But National Geographic, wow, I'd love to have a story about National Geographic, I really respect them. They said, we're gonna set up a photojournalist, and we're gonna go out and, and see if you can find a Garricon. And he asked me, I think his, his girlfriend's in the audience here, his name is Andy, Andy, Andy Isaacson, and Andy goes, how likely is we gonna find a Garricon, Paul? I'm gonna do a story on you. And I said, oh, 50-50. You know, I didn't want to discourage him, right? But I had good reasons. We would get the a motor school a scooter and a, 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 a motor schooner and with a Zodiac, and we went up Desolation Sound, and these are all old growth forests, and he did not want to go to a place we've already been. He said, I want the Eureka experience, you know, and he really want to have an, a, a, an honest, legitimate story. So I took 10 of my friends with me, and we had high-powered binoculars. And I thought, oh, we'd, we'd find a Garricon because we have 10 people looking for it, you know, all day long, and, and I looked for a bald eagles that would be in snags, because the Garricon oftentimes are in snags, bald eagles hang out there, as you can see them, it looks like a big honey, uh, a, a, a big beehive. And so we looked and we looked and we looked and we got retina burn, you know, looking, 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 and after several hours, like, we were all wasted, and, uh, and, and so, uh, 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 not because of other reasons. Um, <laughs> um, that was later. Um, so, so we, uh, we the, the, our skipper said, well, let's go over to a first people site and, you know, and, and have lunch. And so we motored over there, and this is a cliff, that, a big rock that overhangs about 30 feet. And so first peoples would bring up their canoes, and we used to run thick with salmon here, they could be out of the rain, um, very protected, and uh, there's, there's pictographs there. He said, we don't know what the pictographs mean anymore. There was four pandemics that hit the Pacific Coast Native Americans, and elsewhere too, but on the Pacific Coast. And there was two flu pandemics and two smallpox pandemics that, that on average wiped out 90% of the population within 50 years. So the ancestral knowledge was destroyed by pandemic after pandemic after pandemic. And so the first peoples there don't know what these pictographs mean. So we motored over there and we're going over there and Jimmy, one of our top mycologists in our company goes, look at that, bam, we found one. And this one was attached to an upper branch. It looked like it fell teeter-tottered, then it rugo its mycelium back into the tree, met, unified, and then created two legs that grew down. So an extraordinarily unusual agaricon. So wow, Andy's excited, everyone's excited, wow, this is great. And so Scott Franzblau came with us. He's the director of the Tuberculosis Research Institute. And Scott was very interested in ethnomycology. And it turned out that Dioscorides uh, called agaricon as a treatment against consumption, later to be known as tuberculosis. It was, we didn't have that diagnosis back then, but it was a respiratory illness. And so Scott came with us, so we got cultures of agaricon. And then this is one of the pictographs, and it speaks to, and this is from the Haida culture, and this is Raven on the Sea of Eternity uh, in seek of our genitalia, and no one could help Raven on our conquest to find our genitalia except for a fungus man, is the oarsman in the back of the canoe and this fungus man looks very similar to this. Now, we don't know for sure, but how likely is it that we would find a Garricon? I don't know, one out of 100. How likely is we'd find it in a location where pictographs look strangely congruent with the Haida and other North Coast Indians, and the uh, Haida, uh, uh, the other North Coast Indians would carve a Garricon into grave figurines and place it on the graves of shamans to help them go into the afterlife. So the long history and connection of a Garricon with first, uh, first peoples on the, on, on the North Coast. So now I'm gonna jump, jump ahead, you know, six, seven years. And Scott and I and the other co-authors here, we found the anti-tubercular molecule that is resident in a Garricon. It's a chlorinated coumarin. So we published this in the Journal of Natural Products about two years ago. So wow, we were able to do bio-guided fractionation. What that means is that we take the water and we take another nonpolar solvent, and every time we fractionated by, by extracting the, from the mycelium or the mushroom, we went it down, whatever tree branch we went down in the fractionation sequence, whichever is more potent, then we followed that path. That's how drugs are discovered from natural products, called bio-guided fractionation. Long process you know, a huge amount of work. So to Scott's credit at the University of Illinois um, at Chicago, he's the head of the TB, TB Research Institute funded by the Gates Foundation and lots of NIH grants. So that was great. So let's go back to where we were. And we're at that location and we're there 
And then we see this rock. And wow, look at this rock. Wow, that's weird. Well, there's a Garricon, there's a rock, there's a Garricon, there's a rock. <laughs> so we're like going, wow, how likely, I mean, this rock looks like it's carved to look like a Garricon. Or maybe it's a coincidence. I've talked to geologists and they need to inspect it to see if it actually was carved. How likely is it we would find a Garricon? One out of 100. How likely is we find it where there's pictographs that's reminiscent of fungus man and the, and, the, and the canoe helping raven find her genitalia? I don't know, one out of 1,000, one out of 10,000. How likely is it we'd find it where there's a rock that looks strangely like a Garricon? I don't know, one in a million. How likely is it we'd find it on my birthday? <laughs> and this is when Andy looked at us, and my, and my, two, two of my friends, and, and he said, does this happen to Paul and Dusty often? <laughs> and my friends who know me very well and know Dusty very well looked at him straight-eyed, unblinkingly, and said, yes. <laughs> and I think this speaks to a higher truth. I believe that we've entered into a time where there's a convergence of spirituality and science. I am not religious, but I'm spiritual. And as you study nature more and more, the the Awe, the, we're in awe, awe of nature, all of us scientists, all of us in this room are. But I think if you walk with good intentions, you walk with respect for indigenous people, you walk trying to help nature, these things are given to you. You know, this defies the laws of probability. So we started exploring for more Agaricon. Sometimes we have to go up very large trees, this is a 700 year old tree on Cortez Island. This we, we thought was the biggest agaricon in the world. It does not rot the branch that supports it. This one is probably about 60, 70 years of age. This branch is hard as a rock, probably because of calcium oxalate, I'm just guessing, but it seemed to be petrified. It wouldn't serve the mushroom uh, well to rot the branch that's supporting it, it would fall down. And these are incredibly exposed Areas with massive amounts of wind, lightning, sun, you know, rain, snow, and it's the longest living mushroom in the world. So we thought that was the biggest one, and then we got this photograph <laughs> from Northern California. This is that classic NorCal kind of guy, right? <laughs> and this one's about 100 years old. We expect about 150 pounds. We said, can you send us a small piece of tissue? He sends a big clump like this big. So we got that in the culture. So now we have 70 strains of agaricon in culture. And we use GPS to locate them. We don't pick them unless there's going to be a, a logging operation coming through. So by, we have the, by far the largest uh, uh, cultural library of agaricon in the world. And this is what the mycelium looks like when it's growing out. Well, back in May of 2001, I published a series of articles in Herbalgram, a peer-reviewed um, journal. And I surveyed all the antiviral articles ever published in scientific literature. And I wrote a whopping one-page article. That's how many articles were ever published on the antiviral properties of mushrooms. So I published that, everything's fine, 9-11 occurs. Well, 9-11 occurs, and the US Defense Department BioShield Biodefense Program contacts me because of this article that I wrote, saying, Paul, we're very concerned about bioterrorism of viruses. You seem to have some good familiarity with the literature. You have a good library of strains. You've published, we're gonna let you submit natural products to the BioShield Biodefense Program, which is something they would not normally do. Now, before I jump into that, it's important that I show people this, that the mushrooms are the end of the life cycle, but the mycelium progresses there. Far more genes are activated to produce proteins at the mycelial state than at the mushroom state. So the mycelium is far more bioactive genetically, expressing all sorts of compounds to protect itself, than at the end consequence of the life cycle, which is the mushrooms that reproduce. Well, we began to submit our samples to the BioShield Biodefense Program. We did hot water extracts of agaricon, the, the mycelium, the mushrooms, reishi, uh, you know, chaga, all these things. None of the hot water extracts of the mushrooms were active. This is a statement by the viro or head virologist of the BioShield Biodefense Program, and said that any compounds that are two or uh, more are active, 10 or more are considered to be very active. So we submitted our samples, and, um, and I guess the statute of limitations maybe is, is over by now. I think I can say this without getting in trouble. Uh, so we submitted our samples, and Federal Express delivers me a package. And I'm like, wow, there are results from the BioShield Biodefense Program. And I like, like 95 samples. I'm going through it, going through it, no activity, no activity, no activity against pox viruses. Sample 78, high activity. 
Sample like, you know, 80, 81, high activity. Sample like 90, 94, high activity. I went, wow, we have high activity against pox viruses from our extracts. And I had to look up the numbers. They were all agaricon. So I got real excited, and they gave me a gatekeeper at the U.S. Defense Department, a medical doctor, Colonel, that I had to call this Colonel. to be my point of contact, only one point of contact. And so I called him up and go, wow, great research results. This is fantastic. Where do we go from here? And he goes, what research results? And I said, well, Federal Express just said, deliver me these research results from the BioShield program. He goes, you're not supposed to get those. And I said, I'll photocopy them and send them to you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did, and I did. I go to Canada, I go to Canada, and I'm up in Canada, and one of my employees, my general manager calls up, and we only had about 12 employees at the time, and he goes, Paul, there's a helicopter over the laboratories. I go, well, no big deal. I go, I go no, you know, it's really close. It's right on top of the laboratories. I go, how close? He goes, listen, choom, 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 choom. I go, what's the number on the, on the tail? And he goes, there are no numbers. It's a black military Black Hawk helicopter. And I went, oh my goodness. I go, okay, this is what you have to do. Shut down the business immediately. You know what mushrooms are active against pox viruses? I hadn't told the BioShield what, what, which ones were active at that time. Give, give six or seven employees uh, backups of those cultures. Shut down the business. I never want to know who has those cultures. Get them out of here. Shut down the business. So while the helicopter was there, you know, 12 cars, you know, separate. And we shut down the business. Later on, I was told by DOD people that was a perfect thing to do. I decentralized myself as a, tar as a target. Well, things got better with my relationship with the BioShield program. They did a security test on me. Everything was fine. And so then we, and then we, had, um, we discovered a highly act, uh, active, act, high activity of agaricon against orthopoxes, including smallpox. This was then. We have a vetted press release from the Department of Defense. We had better activity than more than 2 million samples submitted, including pharmaceuticals. And there's a NPR interview with myself, the uh, deputy director of the FDA, former one, and a, one, a senior virologist and scientist at the BioShield Biodefense Program. You can Google Stamets, NPR, and smallpox. You know, so this is great. Well, we worked with the University of Mississippi, the National Center for Natural Pox Research. We did the bioguided fractionation, and we found two active molecules active against pox viruses that beat cydofavir. The lowest concentration demonstrated over twice the activity of sadafavir, the positive drug control. So we found new antiviral molecules resident inside of agaricon. Fantastic. Well, there's no real threat from smallpox, hopefully, in the world, but there's a huge threat from flu viruses. So the BioShield Biodefense Program called me up and says, Paul, you know, H5N1 could be weaponized as a flu virus. Can we submit your samples against flu viruses? I said, please do. So we submitted, and we submitted over 700 samples to the BioShield Biodefense Program. We had to have a 30% hit rate uh, with an SI number over 10 for them to keep us in the program. So the positive drug control is ribavirin. You know, anything over 10 is active, so ribavirin's pretty good here. 170, 190, 32. And here's the flu viruses, and here is our mushrooms, and these are our results. Way better than ribavirin but these are ethanol water extracts, 35%. These are human cell tests in vitro, and so we had to reduce the alcohol contact by 100 to 1 to get it down to 0.35%. So this is the activity of our extracts from mycelium diluted 100 to 1, and in many cases, we're more than 10 times more active than the positive drug control. Now, I, of course, I'm super excited about this. This is why I created my business, is I created the business to do research. It's an excuse to create, you know, you know do research projects. So I'm really excited. I'm doing novel research. I know the literature, nothing's in there in the literature. So I decided to file a patent. I filed a patent in, 19, uh, in 2004, and the patent disappeared. And after four years, I talked to my patent attorney going, where's my friggin' patent? It's not, it's not showed up in the patent office on their homepage for applications. He gets a hold of the patent office, and the U.S. Defense Department pulled the patent out of the patent office because of biosecurity. The same reason that you cannot file a patent on a nuclear weapon. You know, the U.S. government can capture that. So we had to do an intergovernment agency trace to pull the patent out from DOD, which they finally released. And the patent then finally, after 10 years, was published and approved on July 1st of last year. And it's approved specifically against uh, flu viruses, uh, herpes, pox viruses, and against E. coli staph and mycobacterium tuberculosis, against tuberculosis. <clears throat> 
Now, it is medically significant to have a, a, a sub, a, a, you know, an extract that is duly active against viruses and bacteria, because many, or if not most, of the people who have respiratory viruses die from bacterial pneumonia. You, the lung, lungs get flooded. So this was like, you know, this patent finally was got approved. Unanimity of opinion of 10 examiners. So we had to go to the Board of Appeals. I think somebody in the US government told them, don't let this patent issue. And so we had these ridiculous rejections. Finally, it was published. And then two years ago, out of the Vector Institute in Russia, which is like the Fort Detrick in the United States, they have smallpox there, they published an article and they identify Garak Khan as being non-toxic, highly active against flu viruses. A peer review, one of the people saw my TED talk, they said, you have to give Paul Stamets credit, and we discovered this eight years earlier, and another article just came out this past year also saying the same thing. So I pre pre our research predated this by about eight or nine years. I showed this, uh, because I gave a talk more than DC, so I got a hold of the, my research scientists you know, at Fort Detrick, who were doing the virology research, I said, come to my talk. So I showed him the same slide, and I said, you know, I told him this whole story, and I said, we beat the Russians by eight years, and a small cheer went up in the audience. <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny. Well, it's not so funny now, because we're in a period of viral storms. There's a confluence of viral storms. H5N2 is a very big, serious threat. We thought it was on the decline these past two weeks. Yesterday in Iowa, a million birds were discovered having H5N2, they have to euthanize them. How do you kill a million birds in one or two days? The carcasses are dead, flies are over them, crows and other, other birds that are predators or meat eaters, they can spread the virus. The virus looked like it came from H5N8 from, from Asia came over combined with the R bird flu viruses and H5N2, highly pathogenic. It has been stated by virologists that the birds have no immunity at all, 100% mortality. If one or two get sick in these chicken farms, there's 200,000 chickens per building. All of them have to be euthanized. So, and, and there are season, seasonality to viruses, but this is now endemic inside the bird population. So it's going to happen over and over and over again. And they, this is, you know, the egg prices are going up. This is a threat to our food web. This is a threat to biosecurity. This is not a weaponizable virus, or it could be a weaponizable virus, but this is coming out of nature. Because of factory farming, deforestation, you know, our increased populations, the stressors that we're putting on the immune system of nature. So we shipped 110 pounds of agaric on mycelium. Two weeks ago, to a bird flu, to a bird a chicken farm in Iowa, 20,000 chickens. Uh, my friend Lee Stein was there on a the phone call last yesterday. All of the chickens in that area. There's a three-kilometer quarantine from one chicken testing positive. All the chickens are washed. They're all, uh, all euthanized. We heard directly from the owner of these chicken farm. 20,000 chickens as an island of immunity, none of them got sick. All the chickens in the perimeter died. That's our first sort of like chicken clinical study that we have. Now, we do not know for sure, and let me emphasize this, we do not know for sure whether their Argarica mycelium helped these chickens not get bird flu. But we have certainly pretty darn good evidence leading up to this conclusion. Now this needs to be tested on a larger scale, and so we're designing that. Okay, this is when the story gets very strange, because I get a hold of NIH virology, and I say, you know, we have 70 strains of agaricon. Some of them will be super producers. We want to test these. And uh, so I, they always told, write info at nrh.virology.gov, and you know, they know my supplier ID number, you know, tell them what you want to do. That's the advice we got over the phone. So we write that email address. 17 minutes later, the director of virology at NIH personally writes back and says, basically, hi, Paul, you're approved. We'd love to have you submit again, but we will not do bioguided fractionation for you. You have to send in a pure structure. I'm like, oh, no. I have natural extracts. There's 200,000 compounds in these mushrooms. Which of those 200,000 compounds are the antivirals? He identified the anti-pox molecules, but when we sent those anti-pox molecules to St. Jude to test against flu viruses, none of them were active. 
So we knew that agaricon had more than one antiviral molecule in it, but the antipox molecules were not active against flu viruses. So, oh my gosh, what do I do? So I, my, most of my ideas come when I'm in that dream state going into wakefulness, that intermediate state where your synapses are not fully connected. And if you can become disciplined enough to set the stage for problem solving, that's really what's helped me. So I'm laying in bed, laying in bed, and I'm really interested in the delignification pathways and the decomposition of wood. That's what I'm, you know, focused on. And I, got, and I knew that the anti-tubercular compound was a coumarin, a polyphenol that Scott and I found in our teammates, active against tuberculosis. I thought, you know, I'm going to focus on polyphenols. So I selected 20 polyphenols that were known in the literature to, to be produced as wood is de de decomposed. I submitted 10 of those to NIH. But before you get approved and they do the test, they have to look at the scientific literature. Have these ever been tested against viruses before? And are they cell wall permeable? So if you meet those two criteria, and they, we did, never been tested before, they said, okay, go ahead and submit. They're not gonna waste their time. Someone's already discovered this. So how do you explain the following? We submitted 10 of these polyphenols, and here is our research results directly from NIH. For flu, herpes, with a positive drug control ribavirin, acyclovir, methyl, methylcytidine, interferon alpha 2b, sadafavir, and fafavir, we beat the positive drug controls on my first submission. Not doing bio-guided fractionation, but what do you call it? Do you call it scientific intuition, an educated guess, or just plain damn good luck? I mean, this is what the pharmaceutical companies spend millions of dollars in, in, over you know, many, many years to find out what solvent will get you to this active principle. Now, against Ebola, there's nothing that's active against Ebola. You know, we were about 50% as a positive drug control. So, so we call up NIH. We go, oh, my gosh, you see these research results. And they looked at the research results, and they go, oh, my, this is really potent. I go, we're really concerned that we have some false positives. Your laboratory may have made a mistake, because what's the likelihood of this happening? And they said, Paul, they can't be for false positives. We sent these to four different laboratories. So you've got to get four laboratories all to make mistakes. So we asked them to resubmit. We got one submission back, proof positive. We have the other submissions that we're waiting for. Okay, so that's a bizarre story. I don't know how to explain it. Um, intuition, luck, you know, providence, nature, Gaia, God, the universe, dark matter, I don't know. It's one of those things. So I want to just end with this story. So we have 10 to 15% of the wood debris resident in the ecosystem that's normal. For millions of years, we were forest people. We were in intimate contact with the forest and dependent upon the forest ecosystem. Now we live in these artificial constructed environments. We invented agriculture about 12,000 years ago, but for millions of years, we were forest people. And now we have denatured nature. We have reduced the amount of rotting wood in the ecosystem precipitously. We have rob robbed the menu of fungal foods from the ecosystem, robbing the food that benefits all these other organisms that I've talked about. So in 1984, I'm growing the garden giant mushroom, the one that's active against E. coli in my garden. These beds, are, these beds are about eight to 10 inches deep, and I inoculate it with a garden giant mushroom. And then I go out to my garden giant bed in July, 1984, and I go there, and bees are moving the wood chips away, and they expose the mycelium and I could see them sipping on the mycelium, the little sweat droplets, for 40 days, from my beehives to my garden giant beds. The bees from dawn to dusk, a constant convoy went back and forth. Like, whoa. I published, the, I was interviewed for Harrow Smith Magazine, 1988, you can look this up. You know, Paul suggests that bees might be coming to this mycelium because of the sugar droplets, because they're producing complex sugars. Everybody ignored me. This was published in my book, Growing Gourmet Medicinal Mushrooms. Some of you have it. In 1994, you know, I made that same observation. A beekeeper in Ontario wrote me. Virtually everybody ignored me. So I didn't think much of this. And then my friend Louis Schwartzberg, who made this movie, he's a Nat Geo and Walt Disney, you know, slow-mo and fast-mo photographer, filmmaker. He says, Paul, what can you do for the bees? Because he knew about my research with entomopathogenic fungi and insects and mycelium that Gary alluded to. 
And I said, wow, you know, he came to me about three years ago. I said, what can you do about the bees and colony collapse disorder? It's terrible. I thought, you know, I had this very strange experience with my bees in my garden. Let me think about that. Well, colony collapse is a, is a symptomology of, of that the bees just disappear. They leave the beehives, they leave the honey, they just disappear. It's very strange. And there's several different factors have been identified. The loss of the foraging grounds, that's a big one, monoculture, we cut down all the trees, we rob the carbon bank, the, the decomposed wind is not there. Law, uh, the the, the uh, bee nutrition is impaired. Uh, mites are injecting viruses, they're out of control. Um, and exposure to neonicotinoids, glyphosphates is interrupting, and glyphosphates have been identified now to interfere with the microbiome of the bees. You know, so it's disrupting the microflora inside their gut, you know, this impairing their ability to absorb food. So this is an example. Thank you, Whole Foods, for providing this. This is the Whole Foods. You know, this is the refrigeration department with bees. This is what it would look like without bees. 30% of your food comes directly from bees. 70% is indirect. Well, so I'm going to tell you a few experiences now. And just start, these are like little boxes. That's, you know, so bees in my garden, that was one. My antiviral research, the BioShield, that was one. And so Dusty and I, we go into the old growth forest and we really tune in to bears because where we collect mushrooms, there's bears. So you look for a bear scat. And so I was talking to Dusty, he said, you know, the red belted polypore, the one I held up at the beginning, that's really common. You know, the, for, the timber industry and the forest service determined that when bears scratch trees, that's an entry wound for the red belted polypore to enter the wood. As a result, the timber industry killed thousands of bears all over North America to protect the timber industry because they wanted more lumber out of the forest. Well, when the bears scratch the trees and the red belly polypore is introduced, you know, it creates a sap run, and bees are going to the sap, the resin, for making propolis, which helps them patch the holes in their hives. Well. Humans are so good at getting it opposite their best interests. As it turns out, we now know that bears, in the West Coast in particular, bring salmon carcasses and sea run trout up on the bank. And by doing so, return sea phosphorus, which is a limiting mineral for the diameter of the growth of the trees. So the bears actually help the forest by bringing back sea phosphorus, allow the trees to grow larger. This is why lowland, old growth forests, the trees are so huge compared to the trees are up at 2,000, 3,000 feet. So Dusty and I, so I told Dusty the story. I said, yeah, the timber industry killed thousands of bears. Or, uh, they're still in the old growth forest, but when they scratch the trees, the, this red belt and polypore mushroom apparently comes in. So we're hiking in the South Fork of the Ho, and then deep in the Olympic Peninsula, way deep in the woods, off trail. And we go around the corner, and Dusty sees this, and went, wow. And as I photograph it, bam, scratch. The best bear strike I've ever seen. And I thought, wow, this is a bear strike, you know, a bear scratch. I said, well, let's make a note of it and let's come back in a few years. So we went back two or three years later. It took us a long time, all day, because we're orienteering through the woods. There's no trail. And we finally find the tree where the bear scratch is. The tree broke off up here, fell over, and sure enough, the red belted polypore was, was, you know, this is not the exact tree, but this is what it looks like. The, the, the red belted polypore is growing out of the, out of the tree. I go, wow, they, they kind of got it right. Bear scratches introduces the red bell of polypore. That's interesting. Okay, that's another experience. Put that in a box. And just, these seem like they're dissociated, but there's a connection here. And then I'm a victim of Google Scholar alerts. <laughs> I put in too many keywords. I got 40 articles to read tomorrow. Um, and so then I was really interested about colony collapse disorder. And these scientists, when they went in to look at the honey, they noticed something uniquely different about the honey from healthy bees versus bees that abandoned their hives because the colony collapse. It turns out the bees are lacking, the honey lacks p cumeric acid. It's a coumarin, it's a polyphenol that comes from the delinification properties of the wood. It turns out that p cumeric acid is an absolute trigger in the upregulation of the cytochrome P450 pathway. We all have it, it's usually primarily in animals in our liver. It breaks down toxins, chemical toxins, hydrocarbons, pesticides, insecticides, fungicides. It turns out that the cytochrome P450 pathway is turned off if you don't have p cumeric acid. And the bees have 47 genes that control it. Most insects have 80. We have about 60 genes that turn on breaking down toxins. So the honey is lasting p cumeric acid. 
I'm laying in bed and I have this huge epiphany. And I call up my friend Lee Stein, who was here in the audience, and I said, Lee, I made these connections. I think I have some way of controlling and helping the bees overcome colony collapse disorder. I was writing another book. Lee goes, stop, stop the book. You focus on this, this is so important. Lee's very good at looking at early adopters. And so then I'm doing more reading and I go, okay. Well, it turns out the EPA approved these insecticides and these pesticides at, at levels not taking into consideration the co-occurrence of our compounds. So there's a confluence. The farmers, when they go out and they're spraying their fields with one chemical agent, they don't wanna go out again and again with separate ones and clean out their tanks. They mix them all together because they can do one application. So the sublethal combination effects of these toxins compound. And it turns out that the bees, their microbiome is inhibited by phosphates and the bees then are unable to detoxify. They have a hyperaccumulation of toxins. They get malaise. They're not good as their duties. And then the use of fungicides kill the fungi that are rotting in the environment, massive monoculture, you know, denuding of the forest system. You know, these factory farms are being produced. And most beekeepers feed their bees sugar water, 50% sugar, 50% water. So I had this idea, okay, I'm gonna try to help save the bees. I contacted the University of California Davis, senior entomologist there, he's retiring. And then I contacted Washington State University and Dr. Steve Shepard said, stop, don't go anywhere else. This is too exciting. So we then created myco honey. This is mycelium based only. And we're able to grow the mycelium and convert it and create this really delicious, taste like honey. It's very sweet with all the sugars. So we created this myco honey and the Dr. Steve, Dr. Steve Shepard at the Washington State University, these are the cages we set up. Um, Lee, Lee and Juniper Stein also financially contributed to these experiments. 100 bees in each cage, you know, uh, five replicates, and we put 10%. Uh, this, this one's pure sugar water, so we give them this, and we give them three, where 10% of the sugar water is our extracts, or 1%, or 0.1%. This is the artist conch. The bees are loving to sip on this. So Steve was really concerned, well, will it kill the bees? So he was really concerned about it. But these are a standard longevity test that he's published a lot on and other researchers have designed. So we submitted about 15 species. And here's a summary of those species. Coincidentally, they all inhabit birch trees. Now the red-belted polypore grows on fir trees, but also grows on deciduous trees, including birch. And so the red-belted polypore, chaga, which you saw earlier, which is active against flu viruses, Amadou, which my hat was made of, and the first antiviral ever discovered came from Amadou. I published that in Herbal Gram. And the red reishi mushroom, that's well known. So here's the results of our experiments on longevity of Amadou, the birch polypore. Highly significant, the number of bees surviving over baseline is huge. This is important because worker bees, when uh, they go out and they fly and they go to the flowers, you, you see them on flowers, it's the last week of their life. They beat their wings till they're shattered. But the bees go out and they don't return. And then nurse bees are prematurely recruited, they leave the brood, and the mites then are injecting viruses into the brood, and the nurse bees abandon the brood to go out to foraging to bring in pollen to protect the hive. They have a priority, you know, a, a priority system. So for the workers then to have longer life, very, very important. Dr. Steve Shepard says, an entomologist of 39 years of experience studying bees, I'm unaware of any materials that extend the life of bees more than this. So then we looked at longevity effects of the red-belted polypore. When we diluted the extract, 1,000 to 1, we increased longevity highly significantly. Wow, we have another polypore mushroom that increases longevity. Well, longevity is one aspect, what about viruses? Chaga is active against viruses that, you know, against bird flu, but here's the control, and there's the viruses skyrocket, and in here is the uh, dose-dependent uh, reduction uh, in the virus population from week one to week two as we increase the concentration of the chaga extract. So what about the antiviral properties of reishi mushrooms? Well, we would do the same similar. The viruses go way up, and as we increase the dosage of the extract, the viruses plummet. 
This is hugely important, and in those extracts is P-cumeric acid that upper regulates the cytochrome P450 pathway. The summary of this research result is this. Here is the controls go up, the viruses go down. Now, the mites are injecting the viruses. The day before, for yesterday, we got the first results back, and we can now, we can precipitously reduce the, the, the mites that are carrying the viruses. Not only the vector, the zoonotic disease vector carrying the viruses, but the recipient of the viruses, we can then help the immune system of the bees and extend their lifespan by reducing the viruses. Now, this is really extraordinary for several reasons. We all grew up with Winnie the Pooh. We all knew that bees go to rotted logs. But I spoke at the National Bee Conference, the North American Mycological Association, and I asked the audience, as I'm asking now, has anyone ever heard of this? that bees are attracted to mycelium. It was well known that bees are attracted to sawdust, but I've surveyed the scientific literature, the popular literature, massive Google search engines. The only one that comes up is me, hiding in plain sight. We don't know the way of the worm. We don't know the way of the bee. And I bring to you the concept, hypothetically, but founded, it's more than a hypothesis, it's a theory. It's founded in fact. Consider the consequences from an evolutionary point of view. We were all forest people for millions of years. We denatured nature, we deforested, we created monoculture. We robbed the menu of decomposing rotting logs from the ecosystem. And that these mushrooms that reduce viruses that harm humans, pox viruses, bird flu, harms birds, harms bats, harms pigs, harms bees, it may well be that the health of the animals inhabiting ecosystems are governed by these polypore mushrooms decomposing wood. If this is true, this is a fundamental insight into the foundation of nature. And it's hiding in plain sight. We have Google, we got Microsoft, we have day traders here in New York making ridiculous amounts of money in nanoseconds, and we haven't made the investment into the way of the bee? This is a direct threat to all of your future, all of our food security. We need to have the financial community step up to the challenge of investing in the very ground upon which we walk to protect not only ourselves, but our future generations. And damn them that don't, because we're experiencing 6x now we're at the cusp of an extinction event, and our grandchildren's grandchildren are calling back in time, asking us to do something, because their lives are dependent upon it. So I invented then a beehive. Why not? So I have reishi mushrooms, chaga mushrooms. I have a fungus that controls mites. Because all beehives have to be replaced, they all end up decomposing you know, with black molds that harm the bees. So I don't want to have the, the beehives decomposed with something that upregulates their immune system, activates the cytochrome P50 pathway, gives them complex sugars, reduces the viruses. And so I just want to conclude here that humans, trees, bears, mushrooms, all terrestrial organisms have evolved to be interconnected with the mycelial web of life. Earth's natural internet. Mycelium may be the neural network of Gaia. The archetype of mycelium may be the neural structure of Godhead. And so I suggest to you as we go into the future that we follow the path of mycelium. And so we've created now a bee-friendly logo to get people bee mushroomed. To get scientists to work across disciplines. Biodiversity is our biosecurity. Habitats have immune systems, the mycelium, the mycelium networks are the cellular bridges that connect us all. And Louis and I are putting together a movie, and I just want to conclude with just a short two minute little film, which I think speaks to Lenny's issues in a very important way.
face today is to understand the language of nature. My mission is to discover the language of nature of all networks that communicate the needs of system. And I believe nature is intelligent. The fact that we lack the language skills to communicate with nature does not impugn the concept that nature is intelligent. It speaks to our inadequacy for communication. If we don't get our act together and come to commonality and understand that the organisms that sustain us today, not only will we destroy those organisms, but we will destroy ourselves. We need to have a paradigm shift in our consciousness. What will it take to achieve that? If I die trying, and if I'm inadequate for the past to make a course change in the evolution of life and planet, okay, I try. Fact is, I try. How many people are not trying? If you knew that every breath you took could save hundreds of lives in the future, how do you walk out of this kind of knowledge? Wouldn't you run that kind of knowledge as fast as you could? I believe nature is a force of good. Good is not only a concept. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Thank you.